Well, you do happen to be working on a thing which seems to have uh, potentially uh, some of the greatest impact on human civilization of anything humans have ever created, which is artificial intelligence. This is on the both detailed technical level and in a high philosophical level you work on. So you've mentioned to me that there's an open letter that you're working on. It's actually uh, going live in a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been having late nights and early mornings. It's been very exciting, actually. I, in short, I have you seen uh, "Don't Look Up," the film? Yes, yes. I don't want to be the movie spoiler for anyone watching this who hasn't yeah. seen it. But if you're watching this, you haven't seen it, watch it mm -hmm. because we are actually acting out. It's it's life imitating art. Humanity is doing exactly that right now, except. It's an asteroid that we are building ourselves. Mm -hmm. Almost nobody is talking about it. People are squabbling across the planet about all sorts of things which seem very minor compared to the asteroid that's about to hit us, right? Uh, most politicians don't even have their radar, this on the radar, they think maybe in 100 years or whatever. Right now, we're at a fork in the road. This is the most important um, fork that humanity has reached in its over 100,000 years on this planet. We're building effectively a, a new species that's smarter than us. It doesn't look so much like a species yet because it's mostly not embodied in robots, but um, that's a technicality which will soon be, be changed. And and this arrival of, of artificial general intelligence that can do all our jobs as well as us and probably shortly thereafter super intelligence, which greatly exceeds our cognitive abilities, it's going to either be the the best thing ever to happen to humanity or the worst. I'm really quite confident that there is not that much middle ground there. But it would be fundamentally transformative to human civilization. Of course, utterly and totally. You know, again, we, we branded ourselves as homo sapiens because it seemed like the basic thing. We're the king of the castle on this planet. We're the smart ones. If we can control everything else. Uh, this could very easily change. We're, we're certainly not gonna be the smartest on the planet for very long if AI, unless AI progress just halts. And we can talk more about why I, I think that's true because it's it's controversial. And, and then we can also talk about reasons you might think it's gonna be the best thing ever. And the reason you think it's gonna, it's gonna be the end of humanity, which is of course, super controversial. But what I think we can, anyone who's working on uh, advanced AI, can agree on is it's it's much like the film don't look up and that it's just really comical how little serious public debate there is about it given how huge it is so what we're talking about is a development of currently things like gpt4 and the signs it's showing of uh, rapid improvement that may in the near term lead to development of super intelligent AGI, AI, general AI systems, and what kind of impact that has on society. Exactly. When that thing is achieves general human level intelligence, and then beyond that, general superhuman level intelligence. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of questions to explore here. So one, you mentioned HALT. Is that uh, the content of the letter? Is yeah. to suggest that maybe we should pause the development of these systems. Exactly. So this is very controversial. From when, when uh, we talked the first time, we talked about how I was involved in starting the Future Life Institute. And what we worked very hard on 2014, 2015 was the mainstream AI safety. Mm -hmm. The idea that there even could be risks and that you could do things about them. Mm -hmm. Before then, a lot of people thought it was just really kooky to even talk about it. And a lot of AI researchers felt worried that this was too flaky and could be bad for funding and that the people who talked about it were just not, didn't understand AI. I'm very, very happy with how that's gone in that now, you know, it's completely mainstream. You go on any AI conference and people talk about AI safety and it's a ter nerdy technical field full of equations and simulations blah, blah, yes. um, as it should be. Uh, but there is this other 
thing, which has been quite taboo up until now, calling for slowdown. So what we've constantly been saying, including myself, I've been biting my tongue a lot, you know, is that, you know, we we don't need to slow down AI development. We just need to win this race, the wisdom race between the growing power of the AI and the growing wisdom with which we manage it. And rather than trying to slow down AI, let's just try to accelerate the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Do all this technical work to figure out how you can actually ensure that your powerful AI is going to do what you want it to do and have society adapt also with um, incentives and regulations so that these things get put to good use. Um, sadly, that didn't pan out. The um, progress on technical AI and capabilities has gone a lot faster than than many people thought uh, back uh, when we started this in 2014. It turned out to be easier to build really advanced AI than we thought. Um, and uh, on the other side, it's gone much slower than we hoped with getting um, policymakers and others to actually put the pla- incentives in place to, to make... Um, steer this in the in the good directions we can maybe we should unpack it and talk a little bit about each so yeah why did it go faster than we, we than a lot of people thought them um, in hindsight it's exactly like building um, flying machines people spent a lot of time wondering about how how do birds fly you know and that turned out to be really hard have you seen the ted talk with a flying bird like a flying robotic bird yeah it flies around the audience but it took a hundred years longer to figure out how to do that than for the Wright brothers to build the first airplane because it turned out there was a much easier way to fly. Yeah. And evolution picked the more complicated one because it had its hands tied. It could only build a, fly, a machine that could assemble itself, mm-hmm. which the Wright brothers didn't care about. They can only build a machine that used only the most common atoms in the periodic table. Mm-hmm. Wright brothers didn't care about that. They could use steel, iron <laughs> atoms. And it had to be able to repair itself and it also had to be incredibly fuel efficient you know a lot of birds use less than half the fuel of a remote controlled plane flying the same distance for humans throw a little more money put a little more fuel in it roof there you go 100 years earlier that's exactly what's happening now with with these large language models the brain is incredibly complicated many people made the mistake you're thinking we had to figure out how the brain does human level AI first before we could build in a machine? That was completely wrong. You can take an incredibly simple computational system called a transformer network and just train it to do something incredibly dumb. Just read a gigantic amount of text and try to predict the next word. And it turns out, if you just throw a ton of compute at that and a ton of data, it gets to be... frighteningly good, like GPT-4, which I've been playing with so much since it came out, right? And um, there's still some debate about whether that can get you all the way to full human level or not. But uh, yeah, we can come back to the details of that and how you might get the human level AI, even if large language models don't. Can you briefly, if it's just as a small tangent, comment on your feelings about GPT-4? So just that you're impressed by this rate of progress, but where where is it? Can GPT-4 reason? What are like the intuitions? What are human interpretable words you can assign to the capabilities of GPT-4 that makes you so damn impressed with it? I'm both very excited about it and terrified. It's an interesting mixture of emotions. All the best things in life include those two somehow. Yeah, I can absolutely reason. Anyone who hasn't played with it, I highly recommend doing that before dissing it. It uh, can do quite quite remarkable reasoning. Uh, I've had to do a lot of things which I realized I couldn't do that myself that well, even. And and it obviously does it dramatically faster than we do too when you watch a type. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's doing that while servicing a massive number of other humans at, at the same time. At the same time, it cannot reason as well as uh, a human can on some tasks, just because it's obviously a limitation from its architecture. You know, we have in our heads what in geek speak is called a recurrent neural network, mm-hmm. 
there are loops. Information can go from this neuron to this neuron to this neuron, and then back to this one. You can like ruminate on something for a while. You can self-reflect a lot. Uh, these large language models that are they cannot like GPT-4. It's it's a so-called transformer, where it's just like a one-way street of information, basically. In geek speak, it's called a feed-forward neural network, and it's only so deep. So it can only do logic that's that many steps and that deep, and it's not. And you can so you can create problems which will fail to solve, you know, for that reason. Um, but the fact that it can do so amazing things with this incredibly simple architecture already is, is quite stunning. And 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 what we see in my lab at MIT when we look inside large language models to try to figure out how they're doing it, which that's the key core focus of of our research. It, it's called um, mechanistic interpretability in geek speak. You know, you have this machine that does something smart. You try to reverse, reverse engineer, see how does it do it? I think of it also as artificial neuroscience. You know, that's exactly <laughs> what neuroscientists it. do with actual brains. But here you have the advantage that you can, you don't have to worry about measurement errors. You can see what every neuron is doing all the time. And, and a recurrent thing we see again and again, there's been a number of beautiful papers quite recently by by a lot of researchers, some of them here even in this area, is where when they figure out how something is done, you can say, oh man, that's such a dumb way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And you read, immediately see how it can be improved. Like for example, there was a beautiful paper recently where they figured out how a large language model stores certain facts, like Eiffel Tower is in Paris. And they figured out exactly how it's stored. And we're, we're able, the proof that they understood it was they could edit it. They changed <laughs> some of the synapses in it. And then they asked it, where's the Eiffel Tower? And it said, it's in Rome. Mm -hmm. And then they asked you, how do you get there? Oh, how do you get there from Germany? Oh, you take this train to Roma Termini train station and this and that. And what might you see if you're in front of it? Oh, you might see the Colosseum. <laughs> so they had edited it. So they thing. literally moved it to Rome. But it, the it's, way that it's storing this information, it's incredibly dumb uh, for, for, for our, any, any fellow nerds listening to this. There was a big matrix, and, a, and roughly speaking, there are certain row and column vectors which encode these things, and the, they correspond very hand-wavily to the principal components. And it would be much more efficient for a sparse matrix to just store in the database, yeah. you know, and... and but and everything so far we've figured out how these things do are ways where you can see they can easily be improved. And the fact that this particular architecture has some roadblocks built into it is in no way going to prevent um, crafty researchers from quickly finding workarounds and making other kinds of architectures sort of go all the way. So so it's um in in short it's turned out to be a lot easier to build human, close to human intelligence than we thought. And that means our runway as a species to get our shit together has, has shortened. And it seems like the scary thing about the effectiveness of large language models. Uh, so Sam Altman, I recently had a conversation with, and he really showed that the leap from GPT-3 to GPT-4 has to do with just a bunch of hacks, a bunch of, uh, little explorations but with a, smart researchers doing a few little fixes here and there. It's not some fundamental leap and transformation in the architecture. And more data and more compute. And more data and compute, but he said the big leaps has to do with not the data and the compute, mm -hmm. but just mm -hmm. learning this new discipline, just yeah. like you said. So researchers are going to look at these architectures and there might be big leaps where you realize, wait, why are we doing this in this dumb way? Yeah. And all of a sudden, this model is 10x smarter. Yeah. And that that can happen on any one day, on any one Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon. And then all of a sudden, you have a system that's 10x smarter. Um, it seems like it's such a new discipline. It's such a yeah. new, like we understand so little about why this thing works so damn well that uh, the linear improvement of compute or exponential, but the steady improvement of compute, steady improvement of the data may not be the thing that even leads to the next leap. It could be a surprise little hack that improves everything. Or a lot of little leaps here and there because, because so much of this is out in the open also. So many smart people are looking at this and trying to figure out little leaps here and there. And uh, it becomes this sort of collective 
race where if a lot of people feel if I don't take the leap, someone else will. And, and this is actually very crucial for for the other part of it. Why do we want to slow this down? So again, what this open letter is calling for is just pausing all training of uh, systems that are more powerful than GPT-4 for six months. To just give a chance for the labs to coordinate a bit on safety and, and for society to adapt, give the right incentives to the labs. Because I, you know, you've interviewed a lot of these people who lead these labs, and you know just as well as I do that they're good people. Mm -hmm. They're idealistic people. They're doing this first and foremost because they believe that AI has a huge potential to help humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, but at the same time, they are trapped in this horrible race to the bottom. Have you read Meditations on Moloch by Scott Alexander? Yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful essay on this poem by Ginsberg where he interprets it as being about this monster. It's this game theory monster that that pits people into against each other in this this race to the bottom where everybody ultimately loses. The, yes. And it, the evil thing about this monster is even though everybody sees it and understands, they still can't get out of the race, right? Most a good fraction of all the bad things that we humans do are caused by Moloch, and I, I like uh, Scott Alexander's um, naming of the monster, so we can we humans can I think of it as an if a thing. Uh, if you look at why do we have overfishing, why do we have more generally the tragedy of the commons? Why is it that um, so? Liv Boré, I don't know if you had her on your podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's become a friend. Yeah, great. She made this awesome point recently that beauty filters that yes. a lot of female influencers feel pressure to use mm -hmm. are exactly Moloch in action again. Mm -hmm. First, nobody was using them and people saw them just the way they were. And then some of them started using it and becoming ever more plastic fantastic. And then the other ones that weren't using it started to realize that if they wanna just keep their, their market share, they have to start using it too. And, that, and then you're in the situation where they're all using it. And, and none of them has any more market share or less than before. So <laughs> nobody gained anything. Everybody lost. And they have to keep becoming ever more plastic fantastic also. right? And uh, But nobody can go back to the old way because it's just <laughs> too costly. right? The, 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 Moloch is everywhere. And... Um, Moloch is not a new arrival on, on the scene either. We humans have developed a lot of collaboration mechanisms to help us fight back against Moloch through various kinds of constructive collaboration. The Soviet Union and the United States did sign a number of, ar of arms control treaties against Moloch, who was trying to stoke them into unnecessarily risky nuclear arms races, et cetera, et cetera. And this is exactly what's happening on the AI front. This time... It's a little bit geopolitics, but it's mostly money, where there's just so much commercial pressure. You know, if you take any of these leaders of the top tech companies, if they just say, you know, this is too, too risky, I want to pause for six months, they're going to get a lot of pressure from shareholders and others. We're like, well, you know, if you pause, but those guys don't pause, we're, we don't want to get our lunch eaten. Yeah. And shareholders even have the power to replace the, the executives in the worst case, right? So we did this open letter because we want to help these idealistic tech executives to do what their heart tells them by providing enough public pressure on the whole sector to just pause so that they can all pause in a coordinated fashion. And I think without the public pressure, none of them can do it alone push back against their shareholders, no matter how good-hearted they are. Because Moloch is a really powerful foe. So the idea is to, for the major developers of AI systems like this, so we're talking about Microsoft, Google, uh, Meta, and anyone else? Well, OpenAI is very close with Microsoft, with Microsoft now, of Microsoft course, tries, yes. and there are, there are plenty of, of, of smaller players. Anthro for example, Anthropic is, is very impressive. There's Conjecture. There's, there's many, many, many players. I don't want to make a long list, so 
leave anyone out. Yeah. Uh, and um, for that reason, it's so important that uh, some coordination happens, that there's external pressure on all of them, saying you all need the pawns, because then the the people, the, the researchers in they, the, these organizations, who, the leaders who want to slow down a little bit, they can say to their shareholders, you know, mm-hmm. everybody's slowing down because of this pressure, and it's, and it's the right thing to do. Have you seen in history there uh, examples where it's possible to pause yes, the Moloch? Absolutely. And even like human cloning, for example, you could make so much money on human cloning. Uh, why aren't we doing it? Because biologists thought hard about this and felt like this is way too risky. We st- they got together all in the 70s in the Silamar and decided even to stop a lot more stuff also, just editing the human germline, right? G- gene editing that goes in to our offspring and decided, let's, let's let's not do this because it's too unpredictable what it's going to lead to. We could lose control over what happens to our species. Mm-hmm. So they paused. Uh, there was a ton of money to be made there. So it's, it's very doable, but you just need, you need a public awareness of the, of what the risks are and the broader community coming in and saying, Hey, let's slow down. And, you know, another, another common pushback I get today is we, we can't stop in the West because China. And in China, undoubtedly, they also get told we can't slow down because the West, because both sides think they're the good guy. Yeah. But look at human cloning, you know. Did China forge ahead with human cloning? There's been exactly one human cloning that's actually been done that I know of. Mm-hmm. It was done by a Chinese guy. Do you know where he is now? Where? In jail. And do you know who put him there? Who? The Chinese government. Not because Westerners said, China, look, this is... No, the Chinese government put him there because they also felt they like control, the Chinese government. If anything, maybe they are even more fo- concerned about having control than than Western governments have no incentive of, of just losing control over where everything is going. And you can also see the Ernie bot that uh, was released by, I believe, Baidu recently. They got a lot of pushback from the government and had to rein it in, you know, in a big way. Um, I think once this basic message comes out that this isn't an arms race, it's a suicide race, where everybody loses if anybody's AI goes out of control, it really changes the whole dynamic. It, it, it's not... It's, and I'll say this again, because this is a very basic point I think a lot of people get wrong. Because a lot of people dismiss the whole idea that AI can really get very superhuman because they think there's something really magical about intelligence such that it can only exist in human minds, you know, because they believe that, they think it's going to kind of get to just more or less GPT-4++ and then that's it. They don't see it as a super as a suicide race. They think whoever gets that first, they're going to control the world, they're going to win. But that's not how it's going to be. And we can talk again about the, the scientific arguments for, for why it's not going to stop there. But <clears throat> the way it's going to be is if, if anybody completely loses control and, you know, you don't care if if, if some some if someone manages to take over the world who really doesn't share your goals, they you probably don't really even care very much about what nationality they have. You're not going to like it. It's much worse than today. Uh, who, if it's if you live in Orwellian dystopia, who, who you, what do you care who's, who created it, right? Uh, and if someone, if it goes farther and, and we just lose control even to the machines so that it's not us versus them, it's us versus it, uh, what do you care who, who created this, this unaligned entity which has goals different from humans ultimately and we get marginalized we get made obsolete we get replaced it, that's why I, what i mean when i say it's a suicide race you know, it's um it's kind of like we're we're rushing towards this cliff uh, but the closer to the, the cliff we get the more scenic the views are and the more money there is there and the more, so so we keep going but we have to also stop at some point right quit while we're ahead and uh it's um It's a suicide race, which cannot be won. But the way to really benefit from it is 
to continue developing awesome AI mm -hmm. a little bit slower. So we make it safe, make sure it does the things that humans want and create a condition where everybody wins. The te technology has shown us that, that you know, geopolitics and, and politics in general is not a zero sum game at all. So there is some rate of development that will lead us as a human species to lose control of this thing. And the hope you have is that there's some lower level of development, which will not, yeah. which will not allow us to lose control. This is an interesting thought you have about losing control. So what, if you have somebody, if you are somebody like Sandra Pachai or uh, Sam Altman at the head yeah. of a company like this, you're saying if they develop an AGI, they too will lose control of it. So no one person can maintain control. No group of individuals can maintain control. If it's, if it's created, very very soon and as a big black box that we don't understand like the large language models yeah then i'm very confident they're going to lose control but this isn't just me saying it you know sam altman and demis asabis have both said mm -hmm. themselves acknowledge that you know there's really great risks with this and they they want to slow down once they feel it gets it's scary it's it, but it's clear that they're stuck in this again moloch is forcing them to go a little faster than, than they're comfortable with because of pressure from just commercial pressures, right? Uh, it, to get a bit optimistic here, of course, this is a problem that can be ultimately solved. Uh, it just to win this wisdom race, it's clear that what we hoped that was going to happen hasn't happened. The the capability progress has gone faster than a lot of people thought, and and the po the progress in in the public sphere of policy making and so on has gone slower than we thought. Even the technical AI safety has gone slower. A lot of the technical safety research was kind of banking on that um, large language models and other poorly understood systems couldn't get us all the way, yeah. that you had to build more of a kind of intelligence that you could understand. Maybe it could prove itself safe, you know, things like this. And um, I'm quite confident that this can be done um, so we can reap all the benefits, but we cannot do it as quickly as... Uh, <laughs> this out of control express train we are on now is going to get the AGI. That's why we need a little more time, I feel. Is there something to be said, what like Sam Altman talked about, which is while we're in the pre AGI stage, to release often and as transparently as possible to learn a lot? So, as opposed to being extremely cautious, release a lot. Don't, uh, don't invest in a closed development where you focus on AI safety, while it's somewhat dumb, quote unquote, uh, release as often as possible. And as you start to see signs of uh, human level intelligence or superhuman level intelligence, then you put a halt on it. Well, what a lot of safety researchers have been saying for many years is that the most dangerous things you can do with an AI is, first of all, teach it to write code. Yeah because that's the first step towards recursive self-improvement, which can take it from AGI to much higher levels. Okay, oops, we've done that. And uh, another thing, high risk is connected to the internet. Let it go to websites, download stuff on its own, uh, and talk to people. Oops, we've done that already. You know, Elias Yudkowsky, you said you interviewed him recently, right? Yes, yep. So he had this tweet recently, which I <laughs> got, gave me one of the best laughs in a while, where he's like, Hey, people used to make fun of me and say you're so stupid, Eliezer, because you're saying you're saying uh, you have to worry. Of obviously, developers once they get to like really strong AI, first thing you're going to do is like never connect it to the internet, keep it in a box yeah. where it has, you know where you can really study it. Safe. So he had written it in the like in the meme form. So it's like then, yeah, and, and then that, and then now. <laughs> Let's lol. Let's make a chatbot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the yeah. third thing, Stuart Russell. Yeah, you know, amazing AI researcher. He ha he has argued for a while that we should never teach AI anything about humans. Above all, we should never let it learn about human psychology and how you manipulate humans. That's the most dangerous kind of knowledge you can give it. Yeah, you can teach it all it needs to know how to, about how to cure cancer and stuff like that, but don't let it read Daniel Kahneman's book about cognitive biases and all yep. that. And then, oops, LOL, you know, let's invent social media al recommender algorithms, which, 
do exactly that. They they get so good at knowing us and pressing our buttons that we've we're starting to create a world now where we just have ever more pe- hatred because they figured out that these algorithms not for out of evil but just to make money on advertising that the best way to get more engagement the euphemism get people glued to their little rectangles right is just to make them pissed off well that's really interesting that a large ai system that's doing the recommender system kind of task on social media is basically just studying human beings because it's a bunch of us Mm -hmm. rats giving it signal non-stop signal. It'll show a thing and then we give signal and whether we spread that thing, we like that thing, that thing increases our engagement, gets us to return to the platform. And it has that on the scale of hundreds of millions of people constantly. So it's just learning and learning and learning. And presumably if the param- the number of parameters in the neural network that's doing the learning and more end to end the learning is, the more it's able to just basically encode how to manipulate human behavior. Exactly. How to control humans at scale. Exactly. And that is not something you think is in humanity's interest. Yes. Yeah, it, right now, it's mainly letting some humans manipulate other humans for profit and power, which already <laughs> caused a lot of damage. And eventually, that's a sort of uh, skill that can tr- make AIs persuade humans to let them escape uh, whatever safety precautions we had put. You know, there was a really nice article. Um, in the New York Times recently by uh, Yuval Noah Harari and, and, and um, two co-authors, including Tristan Harris from The Social Dilemma. And we have this phrase in there I love. It said that humanity's first contact with advanced AI was social media. And we lost that one. We now live in a country where there's much more hate, in the world where there's much more hate, in fact, and in our democracy that we're having this conversation and people can't even agree on who won the last election, you know. And we humans often po- point fingers at other humans and say it's their fault. But it's really Mo- Moloch and these AI algorithms. We got the algorithms and then Moloch pitted the social media companies around against each other so nobody could have a less creepy algorithm because then they would lose out on alg- revenue to the other company. Is there any way to win that battle back just if we just linger on this one? one battle that we've lost in terms of social media. Is it possible to redesign social media, this very medium in which we use as a civilization to communicate with each other, to have these kinds of conversation, to have discourse, to try to figure out how to solve the biggest problems in the world, whether that's nuclear war or the development of AGI. Is is it possible uh, think, to do social media correctly? I think it's not only possible, but it's it's necessary. Who are we kidding that we're going to be able to solve all these other challenges if we can't even have a conversation with each other? That's constructive. The whole idea, the key idea of democracy is that you get a bunch of people together and they have a real conversation. The ones you try to foster on this podcast where you respectfully listen to people you disagree with. And you realize, actually, you know, there are some things, actually, we some common ground we have. And that's, that's, yeah, we both agree, let's not have a nuclear war, let's, let's not do that, um, et cetera, et cetera. We're kidding ourselves thinking we can face the, off the second contact with, with ever more powerful AI that's happening now with these large language models if we can't even have a functional conversation in the public space. That's why I started the Improve the News project, mm-hmm. improvethenews.org. But um, I, I'm an optimist fundamentally in, um, in that there is a lot of intrinsic goodness in, in in people, and that uh, what makes the difference between someone doing good things for, for humanity and bad things is not some sort of fairy tale thing that this person was born with an evil gene and this one was not born with a good gene. No, I think it's whether we put, whether people find themselves in situations that bring out the best in them or that bring out the worst in them. And I feel we're building an internet and a society that brings out the worst. But it doesn't us. have to be that way. No, it does not. So if you, it's possible to create incentives and also create incentives that make money, uh, that both make money and bring out the best in people. I mean, in the long term, it's not a good investment for anyone, you know, to have a nuclear yeah. war, for example. 
And, you know, is it a good investment for humanity if we just ultimately replace all humans by machines and then we're so obsolete that eventually there, there are no humans left? Well, it depends, I guess, on how you do the math. But, but, but I, if, it, I would say by any reasonable economic standard, if you look at the future income of humans and there aren't any, you know, that's not a good investment. Moreover, like, why why can't we have a little bit of pride in our species, damn it? You know, why, why should we just build another species that gets rid of us? If we were Neanderthals, would we really consider it a smart move if the... the if we had really advanced biotech to build Homo sapiens, you 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 know you might say, hey Max, you know yeah, let, let let's build build uh, these Homo sapiens. They're going to be smarter than us. Maybe they can help us defend us better against uh, predators and help fix up our caves, make them nicer, and we'll control them un undoubtedly. You know, and so then they build build a couple, a little baby girl, a little baby boy, you know, and. And then you have some some wise old Neanderthal elder who's like, hmm, I'm scared that uh, we're opening a Pandora's box here and that we're going to get outsmarted by these n n super Neanderthal intelligences and there won't be any Neanderthals left. And then, but then you have a bunch of others in the cave, right? Are you such a Luddite scaremonger? Of course, they're going to want to keep us around because we are their creators and and why you know the smarter I think the smarter they get, the nicer they're gonna get. They're gonna leave us. They're gonna they're gonna want us around, and it's gonna be fine. And and besides, look at these babies. They're so cute. Clearly, they're totally harmless. That's exact. Those babies are exactly GPT four. Yeah. It's not. I want to be clear. It's not GPT four. That's terrifying. It's the GPT four is a baby technology. You know, and Microsoft even had a paper recently out. Uh, with a title something like Sparkles of AGI. Well, they were basically saying this is baby AI, like these little Neanderthal babies. And it's going to grow up. There's going to be other systems from the, from the same company, from other companies. They'll be way more powerful, and but they're going to take all the things, ideas from these babies. And before we know it, we're going to be like... Uh, those last Neanderthals who were pretty disappointed and when they realized that they were getting replaced. Well, this interesting point you make, which is the programming, it's, it's entirely possible that GPT-4 is already the kind of system that can change everything by writing programs. So life three, it's, yeah, it's because it's life 2.0. The, the systems I'm afraid of are gonna look nothing like a large language model and they're not gonna, but once it gets, once it or other people figure out a way of using this tech to make much better tech, right? Mm -hmm. It's just constantly replacing its software. And from everything we've seen about how how these work under the hood, they're like the minimum viable intelligence. They do everything in a, like the dumbest way that still works, sort of. Yeah. And um, so they are life 3.0, except when they replace their software, it's a lot faster than when you when, when you decide to learn Swedish. And moreover, they think a lot faster than us too. So when, uh, you know, we don't think on how one logical step every nanosecond or or, few, or so the, the way they do. And we can't also just suddenly scale up our hardware massively in the cloud. We're so limited, right? Uh, so they are, it, it, they are also life can soon be, become a little bit more like Life 3.0 in that if they need more hardware, hey, just rent it in the cloud, you know? <laughs> How do you pay for it? Well, with all the services you provide. And what we haven't seen yet, which could change a lot, is uh, entire software system. So right now, programming is done sort of in bits and pieces uh, as, as an assistant tool to humans, but I do a lot of programming and mm -hmm. with the kind of stuff that GPT-4 is able to do, I mean, it's, it's replacing a lot what I'm able to do, mm -hmm. but I, you still need a human in the loop to kind of manage the design of things, manage like what are the prompts that generate the kind of stuff to, to do some basic adjustment of the code, to do some debugging. But if it's possible to add on top of GPT-4 kind of uh, feedback loop of of a, of uh, 
self debugging, improving the code, and then you launch that system out into the wild on the internet because everything is connected and have it do things, have it interact with humans, and then get that feedback. Now you have this giant ecosystem yeah. of humans. That's one of the things that uh, yeah. Elon Musk recently sort of tweeted as a case why everyone needs to pay $7 or whatever for Twitter. To make it, sure they're real. They Make sure they're real. We're now going to be living in a world where the the bots are getting smarter and smarter and smarter to a degree where you can't uh, you can't tell the difference between a human and a bot. That's right. And now you can have uh, bots outnumber humans by yeah. uh, one million to one, yeah. which is why he's making a case why you have to pay yeah. to, to prove you're human, yeah. which is yeah. one of the only mechanisms to prove, yeah. which is depressing. And I, yeah, I feel we have to remember. As individuals, we should, from time to time, ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? All right? And as a species, we need to do that too. So if we're building, as, as you say, machines that are outnumbering us and more, more and more outsmarting us and, and replacing us on the job market, not just for the dangerous and, and boring tasks, but also for writing poems and doing art and things that a lot of people find really meaningful, we've got to ask ourselves, why? Why are we doing this? Uh, we are, the answer is Moloch is tricking us into doing it. And it's such a clever trick that even though we see the trick, we still have no choice but to fall for it, right? Come, also, the thing you said about you using uh, Copilot mm -hmm. AI tools to program faster, how many times, what factor faster would you say you, you code now? How, does it go twice as fast? Or? I don't really... Uh, because it's such a new tool. Yeah. It's, I don't know if speed is significantly improved, um, but it feels like I'm a year away from being uh, five to 10 times mm -hmm. faster. So if, if that's typical for programmers, then uh, you're already seeing another kind of self re recursive self-improvement, right? Because previously uh, one, like a major generation of, improvement of the code would happen on the human R&D time scale. Mm -hmm. And now if that's five times shorter, then it's gonna take five times less time than it otherwise would to develop the next level of these tools mm -hmm. and so on. So this, the, the, these, these are the, this is exactly the sort of beginning of an, of an intelligence explosion. There can be humans in the loop a lot in the early mm -hmm. stages, and then eventually humans are needed less and less and the machines can more kind of go alone. But you, what you, you said there is just an exact, example of, of these sort of things. Another thing which which um, I was kind of lying on my psychiatrist, imagining I'm on a psychiatrist's couch here saying, well, what are my fears that people would do with um, AI systems? Another, f so I mentioned three that I had fears about many years ago that they would do, uh, namely uh, teach it the code, <laughs> uh, connect it to the internet and teach it to manipulate humans. A fourth one is building an API. <laughs> where code can control this super powerful thing, right? That's yeah. very unfortunate because uh, one thing that systems like GPT-4 have going for them is that they are an oracle in the sense that they just answer questions. There is no robot connected to, to GPT-4. GPT-4 can't go and do stock trading based on its thinking. Yeah. It is not an agent. An intelligent agent is something that takes in information from the world, processes it, to figure out what action to take based on its goals that it has, and then does something back on the world. But, but it, once you have an API, for, for example, GPT-4, nothing stops Joe Schmo and, all, and a lot of other people from building real agents, which just keep making calls somewhere in some inner loop somewhere to these powerful Oracle systems, and which makes them themselves much more powerful. That's another kind of... Um, unfortunate development, which uh, I think we would have been better off uh, delaying. I don't want to pick on any particular companies. I think they're all under a lot of pressure to make money. Yeah. And um, again, we, the reason we're, we're calling for this pause is to give them all cover to do what they know is the right thing, Just slow down a little bit at this point. But everything we've talked about, I, I hope we'll can will make it clear to people watching this, that, you know, why these sort of human level tools can cause a gradual acceleration. You keep using yesterday's technology to build tomorrow's technology, yeah. and when you do, 
that over and over again, you naturally get an explosion. You know, that's the definition of an explosion in science, right? Like if you have um, two people and they fall in love, uh, now you have four people and then they can make more babies and now you have eight people and then then you have 16, 32, 64, et cetera. That's, we call that an, a population explosion, where it's just that each, if, you, if it's instead free neutrons in a nuclear reaction, that if each one can make more than one, then you get an exponential growth in that. We call it a nuclear explosion. Mm -hmm. All explosions are like that. And an intelligence explosion, it's just exactly the same principle that some quantity, some amount of intelligence can make more intelligence than that. And then repeat, you always get exponentials. What's your intuition why it does, you mentioned there's some technical reasons why it doesn't stop at a certain point. What's your intuition? And uh, do you have any intuition why it might stop? It's obviously going to stop when it bumps up against the laws of physics. There are some things you just can't do no matter how smart you are, right? Allegedly. Because <laughs> well, we don't Lloyd, know the full yeah. laws of physics yeah, like yet, right? Seth Lloyd wrote a really cool paper on the physical limits on uh, computation, for example. If you make it, put too much energy into it in a finite space, it'll turn into a black hole. <laughs> you can't move information around faster than the speed of light, stuff like that. But uh, it's hard to store way more than than a, a modest number of bits per atom etc but you know those limits are just astronomically above like 30 orders of magnitude above where we are now and so you know, bigger different bigger jump in intelligence than if you go from a from an ant to a human i think of course what we want to do is have have a controlled thing like a nuclear reactor you put moderators in to make sure exactly it doesn't blow up out of control right mm -hmm. when we do um experiments with biology and cells and so on you know we also try to make sure it doesn't get out of control um we can do this with ai too the thing is we haven't succeeded yet and moloch is exactly f doing the opposite just fueling just egging everybody on faster 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 or the other company is going to catch up with you or the other country is going to catch up with you we do this we have to want this stuff we have to, and and i don't believe in this just asking people to look into their hearts and do the right thing it's easier for others to say that but like if if you're in the situation where your company is going to get screwed if you by other companies that are not stopping, you know, you're putting people in a very hard situation. The, the, the right thing to do is change the whole incentive structure instead. And, and this is not an old, I, I, maybe I should say one more thing about this, because Moloch has been around as humanity's number one or number two enemy since the beginning of civilization. And, and we came up with some really car cool countermeasures. Like, first of all, already over 100,000 years ago, evolution, realized that it was very unhelpful that people kept killing each other all the time. Yeah. So it, it genetically gave us compassion and made it so that it, like if you get two drunk dudes getting into a pointless bar fight, they might give each other black eyes, but in, they have a lot of inhibition towards, towards just killing each other. That's a gen And similarly, if you find a baby lying on the street when you go out for your morning jog tomorrow, you're going to stop and pick it up, right? Even though it maybe it'll make you late for your next podcast. So evolution gave us these genes that make our own egoistic incentives more aligned with what's good for the greater group we're part of, right? And then uh, as we got a bit more s sophisticated and developed language, we invented gossip, which is also a fantastic anti moloch mm -hmm. right? Because now... It, it really discourages liars, moochers, cheaters, because it, it, their own incentive now is not to do this because word quickly gets around and then suddenly people aren't going to invite them to their dinners anymore and, or trust them. And then when we got still more sophisticated and bigger societies, you know, invented the legal system mm -hmm. where even strangers who didn't couldn't rely on gossip and, and things like this would treat each other, would have an incentive... Now those guys in the bar fight, even if they someone is so drunk that he a actually wants to kill the other guy, 
he also has a little thought in the back of his head that, you know, do I really want to spend the next 10 years eating like really crappy food in a small room? Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to... I'm just going to chill out, you know. So, and we we similarly have tried to give these incentives to our corporations by having having regulation and all sorts of oversight, so that their incentives are aligned with the greater good. We tried really hard, um, and um, the the big problem that we're failing now is not that we haven't tried before, but it's just that the tech is growing much is developing much faster than the regulators have been able to keep up, right? So. Regulators, it's kind of comical that the European Union right now is doing this AI act, right? Which, And for, in the beginning, they had a little opt-out exception that GPT-4 would be completely excluded from regulation. Brilliant idea. What's the logic behind that? Some lobbyists um, pushed successfully for this. So we were actually quite involved with the Future Life Institute, um, Mark Brackel, Mr. Uk, Anthony Aguirre, and others, you know, we're quite involved with um, talking to very, educating various people involved in this process about these general purpose AI models coming and pointing out that they would become the laughing stock if they didn't put it in. So it, the French started pushing for it. It got put in to the draft and it looked like all was good. And then there was a huge counter push from lobbyists. Yeah, there were more lobbyists in Brussels from tech companies than from oil companies, for example. And it looked like it might is going to maybe get taken out again, and now GPT four happened, and I think it's going to stay in. But this just shows, you know, Moloch can be defeated, but the the, the challenge we're facing is that the tech is generally much faster than what the policymakers are, mm -hmm. and a lot of the policymakers also don't have a, a tech background, so it's. it's you know, we really need to work hard to educate them on on how on what's taking place here. So, so we're getting the situation where the first kind of non so I, you know, I define artificial intelligence just as non biological intelligence, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And by that definition, a, a company, a corporation, is also an artificial intelligence because the corporation isn't its humans; it's the system. If its CEO decides. The CEO of a tobacco company decides one morning that she or he doesn't want to sell cigarettes anymore. They'll just put another CEO in there. It's not enough to align the incentives of individual people or in align individual computers' incentives to their owners, which is what technical AI safety research is about. You also have to align the incentives of corporations with a greater good. And some corporations have gotten so big and so powerful very quickly and that uh, in many cases, their lobbyists instead align the regulators to what they want rather than the other way around. It's a classic regulatory capture. All right. Is is uh, the thing that the slowdown hopes to achieve is give enough time to the regulators to catch up or enough time to the companies themselves to breathe and understand how to do AI safety correctly? I think both. and But I think that the vision, the path to success that I see is first you give a breather actually to to the people in these companies, the, their leadership who wants to do the right thing, and they all have safety teams and so on on their companies. Give them a chance to get together with the other companies, uh, and the outside pressure can also help catalyze that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, work out what is it that's what are the reasonable uh, safety requirements one should put on future systems before they get rolled out. There are a lot of people also in academia and elsewhere outside of these companies who, who can be brought into this and have a lot of very good ideas. And then um, I think it's very realistic that within six months, you can get these people coming up. So here's a white paper. Here's where we all think it's reasonable. Um, you know, you didn't, we, just because cars killed a lot of people, you didn't ban cars but they got together a bunch of people and decided, you know, in order to be allowed to sell a car, it has to have a seat belt in it. Mm -hmm. There are the analogous things that you can start requiring a future AI systems so that they are, are safe. And uh, w once this, have, this heavy lifting, this intellectual work has been done by experts in the field, which can be done quickly, I think it's going to be quite easy to get policymakers to to see, yeah, this is a good idea. And it's, it's you know, for the, fight, for the companies to fight Moloch, 
they want, and I, I believe Sam Altman has explicitly called for this, they want the regulators to actually adopt it so that their competition is going to abide by it too, right? You don't want, uh, you don't want to be enacting all these principles and then you abide by them and then you're, there's this one little company that, doesn't sign on to it, and then now they can gradually overtake you. Mm -hmm. Then the companies will get be able to sleep secure, knowing that everybody's playing by the same rules. So, do you think it's possible to develop guardrails that keep the systems from uh, from basically damaging irreparably humanity? Mm -hmm. while still enabling sort of the capitalist fueled competition between yeah. companies as they develop how to best make money with this AI. You think there's a balancing totally. that's possible? Absolutely, I mean, we've seen that in many other sectors where you've had the free market produce quite good things without uh, causing particular harm. Um, when the guardrails are there and they work, you know, Capitalism is a very effective, good way of optimizing for, for just getting the same thing done more efficiently. It's it was, just, but it was good, you know. And like in hindsight, and I've never met anyone, even even on parties way over on the right, in in, in any country who who think it was a bad thinks it was a terrible idea to ba to ban child labor, for example. Yeah, but it seems like this particular technology has gotten so good so fast, become powerful to a degree where you could see in the near term the ability to make a lot of money yeah. and to put guardrails, to develop guardrails quickly in that kind of context seems to be tricky. It's not uh, similar to cars or child labor. It seems like mm -hmm. the opportunity to make a lot of money here very quickly is right here yeah. before so us. Again, it's, there's this cliff. Yeah. It gets, gets quite the, scenic. The closer to the cliff that you go, yeah. the more, the more <laughs> go, the more money there is, the more gold ingots there are on the ground you can pick up yeah. or whatever. So you want to drive there very fast. But it's not in anyone's incentive that we go over the cliff. And it's not like everybody's in their own car. All the cars are connected together with a chain. Yeah. So if anyone goes over, they'll start dragging others down, the others down too. And so ultimately, it's in the selfish interests also of the people in the companies to... Uh, to uh, slow down when the when you can start seeing the contours of the cliff there in front of you, right? And the problem is that um, even though the people who are building the technology and the CEOs, they really get it, the shareholders and these other market forces, they are people who don't honestly mm -hmm. understand that the cliff is there. They usually don't. You have to get quite into the weeds to really appreciate how powerful this is and how fast. And a lot of people are even still stuck again in this idea that intelligent in this carbon chauvinism as i like to call it that you can only have our level of intelligence in humans that there's something magical about it whereas the people in the tech companies who build this stuff they all realize that intelligence is information processing of a certain kind and it really doesn't matter at all whether the information is processed by carbon atoms in neurons and brains or by silicon atoms and some technology we build.